Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Esquire Coaching Radio, where we help attorneys achieve unparalleled personal and professional success. And now here's your host, Anne Jenrette Thomas. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Esquire Coaching Radio Show. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. As you know, Esquire Coaching is a national coaching and consulting firm that's dedicated to empowering lawyers to happily succeed in the business of law. To that end, we discuss the full range of topics from building business to getting a job to work-life balance and everything in between. Today, we have a very special guest, Debbie Irving, who's going to talk to us and have a really candid conversation about race, culture, identity, and privilege. Waking Up White author Debbie Irving offers her firsthand insight to the everyday perpetuation of racial injustice and inequality by well-intentioned white people. A community organizer and classroom teacher for 25 years, Debbie grappled with racial injustice without understanding racism as a systemic issue or her own whiteness as an obstacle to it. Her book tells the story of how she went from well-meaning to well-doing. Waking Up White functions as both a Racism 101 for white people and a rare expose on whiteness for people of color. By sharing her sometimes cringeworthy struggle to understand racism and racial tensions, she offers a fresh perspective on bias, stereotypes, manners, and tolerance. In fact, her husband says, it couldn't have happened to a whiter person. (laughs) Debbie devotes herself to working with white people, exploring the impact white skin can have on perception, problem solving, and engaging in racial justice work. Her first book, Waking Up White, tells the story of how she went from well-meaning to well-doing. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you. It's so I'm great happy, to have you to here. here, and I know we were just chatting before the show began that there is so much going on in the world, in the U.S. in particular, uh, right now on racial justice matters, uh, that this topic is extremely timely, and so happy to have you here. Well, I'm thrilled to be be here. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. Uh, first, before, before I get into some of the... Um, questions that we have prepared, I wanted you to just share a little bit about your experience with the book. What what prompted you to write Waking Up White and and what is your what's the essence of what you're trying to convey with the book? Well the reason I decided to write this book it was that I was in at age forty eight, uh I was in a graduate school course and for the first time I was asked to look at my own racial identity which, by the way, I really didn't understand that I had one. I knew Mm -hmm. to check off white on a census form, but I didn't, if you had said to me, "Um, Debbie, what does it mean to be a New Englander? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to um, have been born in the 1960s? I could have told you a lot um, of nuance about all of those parts of my identity. What does it mean to be white? I wouldn't have had anything to say. Uh, Because for me, race and racism was a problem that belonged to people who were black and brown. And I always wanted to help and be supportive, but I had no understanding that I myself had been soaking in racial ideology my whole life and, and racialized behaviors even without knowing it. And so when I was in this graduate school course and I started to realize, oh, boy, I really had this whole issue upside down and backwards, Um, and I understood how it is mostly perpetuated by well-intentioned white liberal people like me, and it horrified me, and I really wish someone had pulled me aside 25 years earlier and said, psst, you know, I have something I need to tell you, and that was why I decided to write the book, was I know it's a book that would have worked for me if someone had put it in my hands when I was just, you know, a college uh, student. Wow, that's really powerful. So how how do you bring the nuance and historical knowledge and personal f- reflection to these recent current racial events? You know, I think the place to start on answering that is to say what it doesn't look like. A lack of nuance is when you see people say, ah, oh, those college kids are so angry, they're so pushy, they're so sensitive. 
um, or you say people saying the leadership is evil. You know, they're 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 selfish. They're evil. They don't care. Actually, there's a lot of nuance, and so people need to understand the amount of history that has gone down in this country, and even before this country was founded in the European arena to establish the idea of white people as superior. And that has created uh, an ideology, a series of choices, the choice to enslave Africans, the choice to displace indigenous people. That sounds so long ago. And yet it's been an uninterrupted chain of choices and events that have oppressed people of color while simultaneously advantaging uh, white people. And so when we see these eruptions on campus, the idea of white leadership and white superiority has been normalized for hundreds and hundreds of years. So you don't need to be an evil college president to be um, holding oppression in place, which is so hard for somebody in that position to understand. And you are not a um, necessarily a sensitive student of color to be at the end of your rope. I mean, I don't think anyone who isn't a person of color can understand what that end of the rope might feel like because I, as a white person, I just simply never experienced the daily um, persistent slights on and off campus, in and out of my job. So there are layers and layers and layers of understanding, and yet so many people want to go right to point, figuring out, okay, We've got a battle going on. Who's right? Who's wrong? Mm. Very black and white thinking. Um, no yeah. pun intended, but right. So, you know, you you bring up something interesting, which is it is a systemic issue. You know, racism is systemic, and yet when you hear people talk about it, first of all, it just seems like um, it's difficult. There's still there's still a lot of emotion um, and fear around even talking about racism, and uh, in this day and age, it seems like there's a lot of um, people focus on oh we're in a post racial era we are uh, millennials are the next generation everybody gets along they they don't think about race etc. But how do you deal with the fact that? the system hasn't really been changed and yet people are trying to not um address it has that has that come up in the work that you're doing at all oh absolutely and it starts with me so i was someone who was you know on diversity committees for 25 years without understanding that racism was systemic so um, in a minute, I, and I think I need to explain what systemic is because I'm guessing uh, there are listeners who might not understand it. It right. took me a long time to get that. I thought racism was uh, – I, I couldn't be racist or involved in anything racialized because I, I liked people of color. So that's, I think, when people say they're post-racial, post-racial, they think, well, look at campus. Like, I'm surrounded by all this diversity. This is a white person talking, and so there's not a problem. Um, and yet the problem is often, there there are a couple problems going on. One is the social dynamics, is that often people of color are not um, comfortable enough to be open in sharing the pain and the insults that they are experiencing. Because who wants to bring something up that hurts when there's a risk that you won't be believed or the person you're talking to really might not care? And so white people, because of that dynamic, are held in a state of ignorance. And it allows, um, which I feel is what happened to me, I was surrounded by, um, surrounded is definitely an exaggeration. I did have (laughs) friends and colleagues who were people of color, and they just weren't sharing what was really going on with me because, you know, I was sending out signals that I didn't really understand and I didn't know I was sending out those signals. So that contributed to me, um, you know, allowing to hold myself really in a, in a space of ignorance. So that's where the colorblind comments come from. The idea of systemic racism was so confusing to me. Um, I think the quickest way to get at it is it means that uh, systemic racism is when individuals embed their internalized biases 
uh, around race into policy. So uh, a banking policy will have differential lending policies according to skin color. So it will take a black or brown person. There will be more hoops that that person needs to jump through to get the loan. When they get the loan, the rate may be um, higher because of a presumed fear that that person, due to stereotypes, isn't going to be able to pay it off um, or isn't going to be able <clears throat> to pay it off as quickly. So there's that. There's also, just sticking to lending, there are loans that will not get made in certain neighborhoods to certain people of, to people of color because neighborhoods want to be kept white. And one way you can restrict where people buy homes is by controlling it through uh, lending. So that's systemic, and it, and education systems, medical care systems, prison system, transportation system, food supply system, uh, what haven't I mentioned, the policing system, the legal system that you're involved in, uh, and education, I'm talking pre-K to higher ed. There is no system, no institution in the United States of America that isn't susceptible to systemic racism. And it can be very subtle, and it can be very obvious. So and, true. And this is, and and it can feel invisible if if I'm going to the bank and getting a loan, and it feels pretty easy to me, and the rate matches up to what I see, or the rates, you know, in the New York Times. Then I'm not understanding that there's a differential system going on that my you know, colleague of color is experiencing. And if we're not talking about it, then we're not finding out, what, you got charged 9%? Why am I paying 6 So that, again, that's a way to link the interpersonal, individual, and the institutional. Wow, that's a that's a very good way of helping our audience list, uh, understand the systemic nature of racism. So how does your book allow white people to quickly grasp modern racism's inner workings, and actually enter into a conversations with this new awareness and skill? Well, I think some of the best advice I got um, early on when I first decided to write the book was from Peggy McIntosh, who's uh, someone mm-hmm. who's often credited as coming up with the term white privilege when she wrote her um, essay, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack of Privilege. Mm-hmm. And she, I, I, she lives near me, so I was able to uh, go and sit in her office and think about this with her. And she said, you really, really, um, I think will have the most impact, Debbie, if you just tell your own story. Because we don't want to be telling other people what to do. Who wants to hear that? But if you just tell your own story in as raw and vulnerable a way as you can, I think people will listen. And that was the best advice. So if you read my book, when you read my book, listeners, um, it's written just like a memoir. It is a memoir. And so I think it has a lot of impact because people are able to say, ooh, like I see myself there, or no, I don't see myself there, or I did that, or I would never do that. And so just by following my own story, people automatically start to think about their own. And by story, I mean, how were you raised? What messages did you get? What messages didn't you get? Who was around you? Uh, How were grownups making meaning of race or not? What era did you grow up in? What class did you grow up in? What was your religion? You start thinking about all these things. And one of the best, another pieces of advice I got was actually from a black man who I had focus groups um, as I wrote book version after version. The one that's on the shelves now is version 10. The other nine were heavily read and um, I got feedback on them. So um, version six, a black man read it and said to me, Debbie, I really love the idea of white people reading this book, but it's not enough for me that they are voyeurs to your experience. I want them to do their own work. Um, how about you put a question at the end of each chapter? Mm. So I did. So there, are, I think there are 45-ish short chapters in the book, and each chapter does have a question at the end for readers to do their own self-reflection if they choose to, and most most do. It's one of the things I love about your book because it, it really does – start to make it more personal and and, and take it to a, a place where um the reader is is actively participating in the journey. Right. Yeah, and then those questions, the other uh way that this book is being used is entire campuses are reading it and then getting together for conversations and those end of chapter questions are sort of this built-in curriculum. 
So people will choose a couple of the questions to dig into as a group. So it's really, it's I, I am uh, really, really happy with the way the book gets used. And I personally, I thought the only people who would find utility in my book would be white people. I have been so surprised at the amount of utility the book has for people of color. Oh, I want to uh, ask about that. But first, I want to touch on white privilege. You had mentioned um, the the phrase earlier. Could you define it for our audience? Oh, I think this is such a confusing term because most people, so I did, associate privilege with wealth. So... Um, white privilege is the opposite of uh, discrimination. And you can't have discrimina- a short end of a stick without a long end of a stick. Discrimination is getting the short end of the stick. Privilege is the long end of the stick. And before I talk about white privilege, um, to just sort of understand that dynamic, short end of the stick, long end of the stick, discrimination, privilege. So I have able-bodied privilege. I don't have to worry about being discriminated against because of a cognitive or physical disability. I have heterosexual privilege. I don't have to worry about being able to be open about who I love. I was able to marry my husband without any hoops or uh, protests. We're able to have children. He's able to be, uh, should I die at my deathbed? We're able to share insurance. I have Christian privilege. So um, the holidays that I've had my whole life long, I've never had to make a choice between uh, going to work or going to school and celebrating my holiday because in this culture, Christian holidays are um, the ones that are predominantly celebrated. So I have lots and lots of privilege. Um, I also happen to have class privilege. You do not need to have class privilege to have white privilege, but now we're getting to white privilege. So white privilege is the, the lack of discrimination a person experiences based on skin color. So I don't get followed around grocery stores. I don't get charged higher lending rates. I don't get shut out of certain neighborhoods where I might want to live. I have preferential education access because if I'm looking at the public school system, public schools are often linked to neighborhoods. And the way public schools are funded is based on property tax. So if white neighborhoods are more valuable, then those are uh higher budgets, resourcing the public schools. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on and on of the privileges a white person gets. Even a white person living uh, on food stamps will have a different experience than a black or brown person living on food stamps. And the one I'm thinking of right now is that if I were uh, a mother uh, living on food stamps, I would be worrying about a lot but I wouldn't be worried about my 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 daughter or son being shot dead because of the color of their skin, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Wow. This is, uh, thank you so much. I think the way that you just described it and you were able to put it in the context of a, a variety of different types of privileges um, really helps because one of the things that I think is important is for every person to recognize that we can simultaneously walk with both privilege and oppression or, um, you know, whatever the opposite of the privilege might be uh, in different contexts, just the way that you described. So um, thank you for sharing that. Now, let's go back to what you were mentioning earlier, which is that the book also offers um, that it's been useful for readers of color. Can you describe a little bit about what you've noticed to be the the experience uh, for readers of color of, of reading your book? Well, I think the first feedback I got that was so surprising to me was, oh, my God, I for the first time, I believe that white people don't get it. I used to think white people were were denying that there was such a thing as, as racism because they didn't want to give up their privilege. But now I can see, Debbie that it's possible to be totally clueless. So, you know, sort of um, I laid out my socialization so um, in such detail that people were able to see, wow, I could see how it would be possible to be a mm-hmm. white person and really think the playing field was level. Um, another piece of feedback I've gotten is, oh, Thank you, because I feel like I don't have to explain this so much. I'm just giving, putting your book in my colleagues' hands. 
<laughs> and, and and then we can have a conversation that starts at a whole new level. Or, wow, I finally understand that bizarre thing that my boss does where he just gets silent sometimes and I have no idea what he's thinking. And what a person of color uh, will be talking about there will be uh, the the cultural norm in um, dominant white culture of if you don't have anything nice to say, you don't say anything at all. And a lot of people, and don't rock the boat, don't create conflict. So there is a tendency uh, among a lot of, of white people when th- when disagreement or conflict is near, there's just a, you kind of shut down, you go quiet. Mm-hmm. That's a common behavior. And I've also seen white people who are from a, a different class say, oh my God, that's what my boss is doing. Because... That person came from an Italian family and said, oh, God, we kicked and screamed about everything, and everything was out in the open. And then I go to work, and I have no understanding. What is this bizarre behavior where this person just gets quiet sometimes and doesn't say anything? So fascinating. So talk to me about your racial justice work, because I love that you've written this book and that there's you know, a, a great way to get some insights. And now I, I know that you're taking this work and and uh, trying to change things in the world. Talk to me a little bit about what what does your racial justice work look like, and uh, what does it consist of? Well, uh, you know, I thought that I would promote this book for a little while and then go back to being a kindergarten teacher, <clears throat> and that is didn't happen, and I don't think it ever will happen because there's so much need out there, as we can see with college campuses, especially right now. Um, So the people who pick up the phone and ask me to come do workshops and and keynote talks are um, higher education, private schools, school districts, and faith organizations. So there are a lot of Unitarian Universalist churches, for instance, and Quaker churches that are that are doing um, institution-wide reads of my book and then will have me come and talk. And what I find is that because for people who haven't read my book, it's really raw. I'm really, I lay it all out there. I have no mm-hmm. secrets. Um, and so when I go into spaces, what I'm finding is that people want to tell their stories too. They want to get raw. They want to say, this is what I thought. Uh, this is what I'm feeling right now. So they're really... Uh, heavy conversations and insightful conversations. They're breakthrough conversations for an organization. And so what I've had to learn, and I am I am still on such a learning curve, um, I'm having to learn how to facilitate these conversations mm-hmm. that are can be very emotional, can be leave people sort of throbbing and saying, whoa, now what do we do? Where do we go from here? So, uh, and that's not, now I'm not even talking about the conflicting belief systems. It also sometimes comes in, you know, if people have read the book, they're in a very different place than if they haven't. Um, and so sometimes I do have conversations that I'm trying to facilitate where there's just a huge difference of understanding in the room. And so that's my learning curve. It's really to get um, communities talking to one another. One of the things that's the worst fear of a white person doing this work is that um, because it's ever-present is the potential to do more harm than good. Mm-hmm. Because as a white person and raised in this um, mindset that I was raised in and having whiteness so normalized, it's really easy for me to slip back into those ways of thinking and behaving at any moment. And so uh, one of the things I love to do is collaborate with a colleague and so do a, a facilitation in a team. And I have a handful of people around the country that I'm collaborating with now. It's not always practical uh, to get two people in the right same place at the same time, but whenever possible, I do try to do that Um So, for instance, Eddie Moore, Dr. Eddie Moore Jr., who is the founder, uh, director of the White Privilege Conference, Mm -hmm. is one of is somebody who I collaborate with, and um, that's just been a phenomenal experience. You know, when you get two people who are coming from such completely different social locations, meaning different class, different gender, different race, different religion, uh, the ways you see the world or the way you solve any problem is so different. 
that you end up almost uh, doubling, you know, expanding the way you can create a workshop or engage in a conversation. So that's that's my favorite way to work. It's cross racially. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, how do you deal with the resistance? You know, I think as I mentioned earlier, there there is a lot of fear some to, to even talk about uh race racism or one's own experience of it. And so, how do you deal with and help dismantle some of that fear and or resistance? Well, you know, you've there are people who um, believe that there is a racial caste system in this country that should be upheld. And, you know, those are not people who I intend to work with. If they're in the room, I don't need to spend a lot of time with them because their agenda is very different. So I'm focusing on working with people who believe uh, in the American ideals, life, liberty, justice for all, and are stymied about why aren't we getting there? What's going on? And even within that group, there's resistance. And so that's the kind of a resistance I want to talk about right now. And that's the kind of place, that's the space that I lived in my whole life was I thought I was just trying to help people who couldn't help themselves. I didn't understand. I was complicit in a system and that I had inherited this whole, whole way of seeing the world, being in the world, and that a huge piece of the of the work was for me to work on myself and my beliefs and my perceptions um, and my behaviors and my way of engaging. And so what I do is I model what that looks like. I'm very explicit about that in my presentations. I'm very explicit about that in my book. And then um, we I model that in facilitating. And so when somebody says, um, in in the kind, the people who show up to my events are less likely to say, I don't think that blah, blah, blah. They're more likely to say, I'm really wrestling with blah, blah, blah. Mm. And then I just try to open up a conversation where, you know, conversation is the way people think together. And so I try to get conversation going. And there are a couple major obstacles to cross-racial conversation. One is that language. A lot of us don't even know. I mean, you ask 50 people to define racism, and you'll probably get 40 different definitions. So, (laughs) you know, just getting some uh, language, some common language in the room. The other thing that's uh, a real barrier is that for many and not all, but for many people of color, they have spoken about race daily their entire lives. You compare that, this is uh, that course I took that was the big Wake Me Up course. The first day of that course, there was a survey um, that we had to take. It had one question on it. The question was, how often do you and your closest friends and families talk about race? So the choices were daily, weekly, monthly, twice a year, less than once a year. Well, I said I went back and forth between, you know, twice a year and less than once a year, I think. I couldn't believe there were people on this planet who talked about race daily. Mm. And so you think about what the what the conversational ability and the thought ability is of a person who's been discussing and exploring an issue every day of their life when they're trying to have a conversation with someone who's barely spoken about it and has been taught that it's rude or racist to talk about it. And so, again, I make that differential. I say, look, this is the reality. We've got people in this room who've been talking about this every day who have a really deep deep understanding, and we've got people who are afraid to open their mouth. So let's just get that out there. You know, if you want to identify which kind of person you are, let's do that. So I'm always trying to make the invisible uh, visible and just name the elephant in the room and let move on. Wow. Work with the elephant. Well, Debbie, I have to say, this has been such an enlightening conversation. I can't believe that our time is up, but please tell our listeners how they can reach you and uh, where they can get a copy of your book. Yeah, so Waking Up White is sold wherever books are sold Amazon, Barnes and Noble, your local bookstore, your library. There's an e version, there's an audiobook coming out in 2016. Um, and visit my website, debbieirving.com. Debbie's with a Y, Irving's with an I. TED Talk on there. Um, my, edu- my website's educational and interactive, and I lead people to lots of other resources because I am not the only person in the country doing this. 
Fantastic. Keep up the amazing work. And um, listeners, let's keep this conversation going. Talk to us about what are some of the ahas you got from from this particular uh, radio show. And uh, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and just share your thoughts. Let's keep this dialogue going. Debbie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Anne. It's been really great. All right, everyone. I want to wish everyone a happy holiday, and uh, we'll be back in the new year. Take care.